Thank you, Corey. And if you did have anything to do with getting it an oral presentation, thank you very much for that. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about shared decision making at the end of life, and I'm definitely going to be building on a lot of things that Beth said during her excellent talk. Um, let's see. There we go. All right. So why do we care about shared decision making at the end of life? Well, I think the answer to that is pretty clear, that as oncologists, physicians, nurse practitioners, social workers, we all want to make sure that our patients have a good death. And often that's defined as sort of a death in a place or manner of their preference and as comfortable as possible. But I think one of the challenges that we face in oncology when we focus on sort of end of life being a very discreet time after months or years of cancer treatment is that it's not always clear when the end of life begins, for example, in a patient who's diagnosed with a serious cancer, like advanced lung cancer. So I would extend the sort of definition of goal uh, concordant care at the end of life to include really good and effective and compassionate communication and decision making throughout the course of illness. So again, the benefits of this approach is it doesn't require us to know when our patients are at the end of life because we know that we often don't know when our patients are at the end of life. And it also enables us to make sure patients are making good decisions that are in line with their goals and preferences and values throughout the course of illness and also provides a really key framework for patient-clinician communication along the illness trajectory because, again, harpening on one of Beth's points, these are not one-time conversations. We need to view these discussions as something that begins at diagnosis, continues throughout the illness course, and then again focuses on difficult decisions about end-of-life care when patients are in the last weeks or months of their life. So again, the exact terminology on this slide certainly isn't you know, mandated, it's not required, but this is sort of the framework that I think about when I'm meeting patients who have advanced disease is around the time that they're diagnosed, within those first few visits, sort of disclose that their cancer is incurable. When their health status declines, sort of acknowledge their declining health status. Generally, you're not telling a patient anything they don't already know. Patients know when they're becoming more ill. So, you know, it shouldn't be the elephant of the room. Acknowledge that they are becoming more ill. They've been hospitalized. Their cancer is progressing. And then certainly when they are closer to the end of their life, recommend discontinuing cancer treatment and focusing on comfort. But again, it's important as you're having this dialogue throughout their course of illness to always be eliciting patients' values, goals, and wishes. These are really two-way conversations. And the problem is if we start our com communication here, which is probably more the standard is to sort of not discuss prognosis, not discuss goals of care, follow patients for weeks or months or years, and then when you're quote unquote out of chemotherapy options, one of my most hated expressions of all time, then start talking about end of life care. But there are a lot of problems with that approach. Really, you have not prepared patients and their families. They didn't know they had an incurable illness. They didn't know they were quote unquote running out of cancer treatment. So if you sort of blindside them by talking about their end of life care preferences, they're not prepared. They're angry, they're scared, and we haven't given them the gift that we should be giving all of our patients of giving them the time, the emotional space, to think about the things that they want to do and do the things that they want to do before they die. So again, I would view this sort of like a, a, a long-term dialogue, a give and take, that we give patients information about their diagnosis. They're not physicians. They're not nurses. They don't know about lung cancer unless we tell them but also gather information from them, some of the sort of techniques for that that Beth talked about, what's important to you, how do you want to spend your time. So often oncologists say, well, I, I hear all that, I see all that, but do patients and their families really want this information? Do patients really want to be told their prognosis? Do they want to disclose information about goals of treatment? 
And multiple, multiple studies have shown that patients and their families do want this information. Again, they want to hear it in a, in a compassionate and warm fashion. They may want to negotiate a little bit sort of the timing and the content of these conversations. But again, in this particular study, do you want to be informed about your illness? The majority of patients and their families said yes. With respect to, I would like my cancer specialist to be realistic about my future, emphasize what can and cannot be done, and tell me about my prognosis before telling others. Another study of advanced cancer patients, the majority of patients reported that is very or extremely important for them to know about their prognosis. And similarly, the majority of patients stated that they wanted to hear as many details as possible about their diagnosis and treatment. Again, with respect to the, the timing of this, is what is the best time for us to start engaging in conversations with our patients about their prognosis and goals of treatment? In this particular study, patients mostly endorsed that they wanted to hear about their treatment goals and options when their cancer has first spread. And again, in the face of a life-threatening illness, the majority of patients report that the appropriate time to disclose that they have an incurable or terminal condition is immediately. So just to sort of illustrate some of these communication techniques, I'm just gonna integrate a case into the rest of the talk. So this was a 48-year-old female who presented with back pain, ultimately had a chest CT, had a lung mass, diffuse lymphadenopathy, and her biopsy confirmed adenocarcinoma. So again, sort of the first step is to disclose to the patient and their family that this patient has an incurable illness. So how do we do that? Well, first, we have to communicate to patients and their families that either their brain MRI or the biopsy of their liver confirmed that they had metastatic lung cancer. But to Beth's point, people without medical training do not know that metastatic means incurable. They don't know that stage four means incurable. Even if you use words like, well, the cancer spread to your bone, they don't know that that is incurable. So again, we don't want to scare people with awful language. We don't want to hit them over the head with it. But what I often do is say that because the cancer has spread, the goal of the treatment is to prevent the cancer from growing and, sp and spreading further. We hope that the treatment is going to make them feel better and live longer, but that treatment will not offer a chance of cure. And again, there's a lot of variation in how patients and their families respond to statements like this. They may not be ready that particular day to discuss their prognosis in more detail. So again, these are conversations that will happen over time. But over time, as patients want more information about their prognosis, how do we sort of give them more information so that they have a sense, is their prognosis months or years or longer? And one technique that I do is sort of frame the discussion if I can be optimistic, if it is a young, healthy person who I think will do very well, then I will share that with them. But of course, we don't want to provide false hope, and we don't want to say that we know exactly the patient, how long the patient has to live if we don't. And the reality is, often we have no idea how long the patient is going to live. So statements like, you know, even 10 years ago, many patients with metastatic lung cancer didn't live a year, but now we commonly see patients live a year or two. That's an honest statement. You're not telling the patient you're gonna live a year or you're gonna live six months, but you're actually giving them information for them to understand, well, my prognosis probably is a year or so. Again, if it is a young, healthy person, maybe that you're optimistic is gonna have a mutation, you can say, because you're young and healthy, I'm optimistic that you're going to do better. But of course, if it's an 80-year-old with multiple comorbidities, then you want to use statements like, because you're older and have other medical problems, we should be prepared that your life expectancy might be shorter. Sometimes patients really do push you. They want to know exactly how long they have to live. And again, those are really hard answers for us. And how I sort of handle those conversations is number one, empathize with the patient. The reality is if I was diagnosed with a life-threatening cancer, I too would wanna know exactly how long I have to live. I think that is really important information. But take the time to explain to patients and their families that unfortunately, we just don't know. Often in those first few weeks in a patient who looks really healthy, 
we don't know if they're going to be one of those fortunate people who are on pemetrexid for four years or they're going to pass away within months. So another way that I, start, I handle that is I often say something like, when I start to worry that we're getting close to the end of your life, I will let you and your family know so that you can start making plans and decisions about their care. So again, I don't leave them hanging. I can't tell them exactly how they're, long they're going to live, but I give them some reassurance that when I'm worried, I will let them know so that they can make decisions. And again, without kind of hitting them over the head that they're gonna die of their cancer, I'm using words like end of life to kind of reinforce the messaging that their cancer is incurable. Beth talked about this study as well. We know that these conversations are incredibly important because the majority of patients with cancer do have overly optimistic perceptions about their cancer. And although there's multiple reasons for this, at least a large part of it is that we tend to not engage in these discussions with our patients and their families. And you might say, okay, I heard all that stuff you said about patients wanting this information, but what's the downside of patients with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer walking around and think they're gonna live for 10 years? What's the problem with that approach? Well, there are big problems with that approach because patients make decisions based on their sort of understanding, their expectation about the likely course of their illness. And this is true for medical decisions. So we know that patients who overestimate their chance of survival are more likely to prefer and receive life-extending therapy, like be resuscitated or spend time in the ICU. And importantly, they're also less likely to discuss hospice care. But prognostic understanding doesn't just impact medical decisions. It impacts how patients spend their time. So a patient's awareness or knowledge of their prognosis enables them to make decisions about how they want to spend their potentially limited time. If a patient doesn't understand that they might only have months to live and they continue to work 70 hours a week as a physician in a cancer center, that may not be how they wanted to spend their time. So letting patients know, you know, if you don't take that trip to Disney World this year, unfortunately, you might not get there. I am a huge Disney World and roller coaster fan, hence the Mickey Mouse. But if patients don't understand this, they're not going to take that big trip. And even more importantly, for the mother who's not going to make it to her son's high school graduation, or the father who's not gonna be there when their daughter gets married, you're not giving them the opportunity to write letters, I guess that's old fashioned now, but make videos or record things on their iPhones so they can share their thoughts with their loved ones if they're not there to be present for these important life events. Sometimes we kind of get frustrated and even frustrated with some of that data, like I just showed you from Jane Weeks' study, because you say, you know, I do have these conversations, I discuss my patient's prognosis with them, and I think they get it, and then they come in next month and they start talking about something that's gonna happen five years from now. Like, why is this patient in denial? And certainly, sometimes our patients have moments of denial, and that isn't always a bad coping mechanism. And there's clear data that sort of people swing in and out of their ability to sort of accept and integrate this information. And some amount of swinging is a good thing. You know, we want people to be hopeful for the future, and we can certainly support them and their hope. And I think kind of the best way to think about this is for a patient living with a life-threatening diagnosis, whether it's cancer or something else, you know, they can't wake up every morning, get their cup of coffee, sit there with a the newspaper and think, you know, I'm going to die of my cancer. No one can live their life that way. So again, don't get frustrated when your patients sort of seem like they're being overly optimistic. As long as you're engaging in these conversations and checking in with them, it's okay for them to have moments where they feel very hopeful. So again, in the patient that I shared with you, I disclosed the incurable nature of their disease. And then often, if things are going smoothly, it's not always necessary to sort of re-engage in these difficult conversations. With the caveat, I do think it's important and probably beneficial during quiet times, when patients are doing well, when they're not becoming more ill, when they're not hospitalized, to actually talk to them about their resuscitation preferences. We know that for the most part, there are caveats, you know, patients with advanced incurable illness 
shouldn't be resuscitated when they have a life-threatening event. And again, it's helpful to talk to patients about that when they're feeling well, not when they're in the hospital and feeling very sick, and to sort of engage in these conversations so patients have time to consider their options. But then again, as their health status worsens, that's another time to sort of re-engage in some conversations about prognosis and goals of care. And sort of one technique, or at least prompt or reminder that I use for myself is that when patients have progressive disease and are quote unquote probably well enough for another line of therapy, I sort of use that as an opportunity to tell them that it's unlikely that they'll be well enough for another treatment if this one doesn't work. And then for the most part, unless maybe it's immunotherapy, I also let them know that sort of the chance that this line of treatment will keep their cancer from growing or under control as long as the previous one is unlikely. And again, if it's a patient who really hasn't been able to engage in end-of-life conversations during those quiet or well periods, like this case was, I will give them a warning shot about a conversation about end-of-life care. I don't ever sort of throw a conversation about end-of-life care on a patient without warning. They want to think about their options. They may not want to have their husband with them for that conversation, or they may want to have their husband with them, and they might not be there that day. So again, giving patients a warning shot so again, they can negotiate how much they want to talk to their family and who they want with them for that conversation is really important. So this patient actually had an EGFR mutation, so building on your last session, and uh, actually responded to serial sequential tyrosine kinase inhibitors for a little bit shorter than the average person. But when she developed progressive disease, her, her cancer really exploded. She needed radiation therapy and was doing very poorly. So again, as I mentioned on the previous slide, when we started Pemetrexid, I let her know that I didn't think she'd be well enough for another line of treatment if it didn't work. And unfortunately, after two cycles of Pemetrexid, her performance and functional status worsened pretty significantly. So going back to something I said at the beginning, when patients ask about prognosis and I don't feel like I can give them an accurate sense, I did follow up on my promise. I let her know that at this point, I was worried that we were in the last few months of life. As she was a young woman with young children, you know, negotiating these conversations with her wasn't easy. It wasn't always easy to elicit her goals and values. But at this time, with her health status being so poor, she was able to acknowledge that she really hadn't disclosed to her teenage children how poor her health status was, and this was a good time for her to do that. And again, because she wasn't going to be there for their important life events, she did want to leave a legacy through letters and video. And again, I sort of gave her her warning shot. Trust me, I had tried many times to talk about her end-of-life care preferences, that we were going to do it at the next visit. And again, this was a patient, she did not want her husband present for that conversation. So why do we have end-of-life care conversations with our patients? Again, I think the data here is very clear that patients who participate in end-of-life care conversations make better decisions about their medical care. They're less likely to be admitted to ICU, less likely to be resuscitated, and are referred for hospice services earlier in the course of illness. Patients who sort of understand or acknowledge that their cancer is incurable and have had end-of-life care conversations are more likely to receive end-of-life care that are sort of in line and in goal with, uh, consistent with their goals and preferences. So again, these things don't always go as smoothly as we hoped. I would have loved to have these conversations and refer this patient to hospice before our hospitalization. But again, she needed to negotiate some of these decisions on her own. She was admitted to the hospital soon after that visit with pain and increasing dyspnea. At that time, when I recommended that she not be resuscitated in the face of a life-threatening event, she did, a, she did agree. And at discharge, again, she just wasn't willing or ready to enroll in hospice services, so we did a bridge program, and eventually she did transition to hospice and have a quote-unquote good death for those last few weeks of life. So again, I think the big take-home message is to integrate these conversations throughout the course of illness. These are not one-time events. And as Beth referred to, you know, these serious illness conversation guides can be very helpful, but not all at once. 
we want to make sure that we're giving patients information in sort of ways and schedules that they can tolerate, but integrating these conversations throughout. I know you probably can't read that slide and you don't have to. This is just to say that there are a lot of resources out there if you don't feel comfortable or feel as if you have the skills and techniques to have these conversations. We sort of talked a little bit about the hope and I worry conversation or best case, worst case scenario, but there are many resources out there to sort of help people engage in these conversations if they don't feel like it's something they've been adequately or appropriately trained in. So again, integrating discussions with patients throughout their course of illness about the likely outcome of their illness, their prognosis, their health status, especially as it's declining, but always eliciting their goals and values, and then ultimately discussing their end-of-life care preferences can help ensure the delivery of high-quality care and shared decision-making at the end of life. Thank you.